Good morning. Uh, this morning I'm coming to you from Oklahoma City. Uh, Southern Hills Baptist Church has allowed me to use the recording equipment, which I'm very grateful for. And I'm hoping to get back to Indonesia in the next few weeks. Our, our visa should come in the next few days. And so we're hoping pretty soon to be worshiping in Jakarta with you guys. Uh, and today we're starting a new sermon series called The Things That Matter. And we're going to start out with the gospel because the gospel is one of the things that matters most to us. And so I, I think it's appropriate to ask the question, why does the gospel matter to each of us? And individually, uh, the gospel diagnoses the problem of mankind clearly, that we are lost, that we are broken, that we deserve death and hell, that we're not okay, I'm not okay, you're not okay. But the gospel also tells us that there is a solution to that problem, and that that solution is salvation and transformation through Jesus Christ. But also corporately, the gospel matters because it's the basis of our shared identity as the church, the body of Christ. Now, we, the, Christianity is not an individualistic religion where we each just have our personal relationship with God and we just walk according to how that relationship goes with God. But we are part of a bigger body and we walk through this life together. But the, the gospel also matters because it's the focal point of all our beliefs and practices as a faith community. So when we ask, why do we do this? Or why do we do that? We do that because we trust the Bible and we believe in the gospel. That's why we uh, do the things and believe the things that we do. So I think for, for us, the gospel is very important as individuals and as the body of Christ, but often we are afraid to share the gospel. And the gospel somewhat scares us because it's offensive to the world. It's offensive because it says we're not okay, that you and I are not okay. There's something wrong with us, and only Jesus can fix it. There's only one path to getting fixed, and that is Jesus. Also, it's offensive because it obligates us and others to turn away from some things we really like doing that we shouldn't be doing. And the world finds that very offensive, and if we share that message that there needs to be a change in their lives, people can get very offended with us. So when I was about 16 years old, I'd just come to Christ. Uh, I had been a believer maybe three, four months. And one day I rode by this ice cream shop in our town. And there were all these guys that we called the skater dudes. They were hanging out at the ice cream shop. And I felt really impressed by the Lord. The first time I'd ever felt that. Impressed by the Lord to stop and share my faith with those guys. And so I did what most Christians would do in that situation. I kept on driving. Because I was afraid. I did not want to offend those guys. They weren't like me. I didn't really understand them well. And I felt like they were probably not going to receive me well. But the Lord really impressed me. Go back and talk to them. So I turned around and I passed them again and kept driving. And the Lord really impressed me. No, go and stop. So I turned around and I stopped. And I got out and I just walked up to these guys and said, Hey guys, I know this sounds crazy, but I really feel that God is telling me I need to talk with you guys and share the gospel. And so I sat down for about 20 minutes and I babbled incoherently, I'm pretty certain, about, I'm not even sure what I said there. And at the end, I was feeling kind of ashamed and embarrassed uh, because I really hadn't been able to clearly share the gospel. And I just gave them my Bible. I said, just read this. And I got up and I walked away and I never saw those guys again. And it really impressed on me the need to learn to really share the gospel. And so I thought, you know, if I'm going to learn to share the gospel, what model should I use or how should I go about doing that? I think um, the Emmaus Road gives us a, a kind of a great model. If you know the Emmaus Road, that Jesus has just been risen from the dead uh, and he meets these two disciples walking along the road to Emmaus, from Jerusalem to Emmaus, and he just begins to talk to them, but that they don't know who he is. He hasn't revealed himself to them in a way that they know who he is. But he says... Uh, they, they begin to talk, and at some point he says to them, O foolish one, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted them and in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. And if you actually look what, at what Stephen did before his stoning, what uh, Paul and Peter and those guys do when they share the gospel, often they would go back to the Old Testament to Moses and the prophets, and they would begin to share why the scriptures actually pointed to Jesus. So I think that's a fair well, well, that's a fair way for us to learn to share our faith as well. So going back to the Old Testament, uh, 
What does it teach us about the gospel? Well, Genesis 1 through 2 tells us that God created a perfect world where there was no sin, death, suffering, and he created mankind and he placed them in that garden. Uh, and he, it says that he created them in his image. And then in Genesis 1, 28, it says that they were to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. They were to fill the earth with people who were reflecting God's image and bringing glory to him. And in Genesis 1, 31, it ends that uh, passage about the creation by saying, And God saw that everything he had made, and behold, it was very good. So the world was good. There was no sin, no suffering, no pain, no death. But then we look to chapter 3, and we see the fall of mankind. We see that God placed a tree in that garden. And he told them not to eat from that tree, that if they ate from that tree, they would die. He gave them everything else they needed, but he withheld this one thing. And then we see the serpent come into the garden, Satan, and he begins to talk to them and begins to make them doubt God's word, make them doubt God's goodness, that somehow God is withholding something good from them. And so Adam and Eve decided to take from the fruit and to eat from it. And that brought the curse of sin and death into the world. That's why all bad things that we we experience happen. In fact, it says that not just we are cursed through this curse of sin and death, but all of creation. In Romans 8.22, it says the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. So our decision to keep on sinning, and Adam and Eve only sinned once, right? And, and it brought the curse of sin and death, but we all have sinned many, many times. Um, but that is why bad things happen to us. But God still loved mankind. If you go on through the scriptures to Moses, it talks about the giving of the law. And it, it, it indicates that the law wasn't given to save us, but it was given as a standard of God's righteousness to help us see how far, far we as humanity had fallen from that standard. I always think of it as this great big monument, these, you know, the, the stone tablets being like you know, 100 foot tall. And we have these little people standing down below it, looking up at that law going, I cannot reach that standard. Um, it's like a ruler. You know, if the ruler was 100 foot tall and we're down at the bottom of it, I'm six foot tall. Six foot tall, there's no way I'm going to reach the top of that ruler. Um, Romans 3, 19 through 20 says that the law was actually good because through the law comes knowledge of sin. And in Romans 3.23, it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We do not reach his standard of righteousness. We are guilty and we deserve death and hell. But the law also tells us that the sacrificial system was given to us because we could not meet that standard. And it says that a, a person would take an animal, an innocent animal, and that they would place their hands on that animal and that that animal would die in their place. And Leviticus 1.4 says, He shall lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. That means it will cover his sin. The death of that innocent thing will cover his sin. Because Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death. So something innocent must die in our place for the guilty. That was a temporary fix, though. And it says that good works are not an acceptable payment of sin. Uh, in Romans 3.20, it says, For by works of the law no human being will be justified in his sight. And Ephesians 2.8-9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. I often have people come up to me and say, Well, what about Gandhi? You know, Gandhi didn't believe in Jesus, but he was such a great man. He did so many good things. And you have many other people out throughout history who have done good things. And I always tell them, Well, if you go to Grand Lucky, you know, if you're if you're at JICF and you walked across the street and you went to Grand Lucky and you were purchasing your groceries and you get up to the cashier and you give that cashier a hundred US dollar bill, or let's say you gave her a thousand ringgits from Malaysia, the the cashier is going to say, well, I'm sorry, you can't pay for your groceries with this money. You need Indonesian rupiah. In the same way for us in salvation, Good works are not the payment that is required for salvation from sin. The only thing that can cover our sins is the this death of something innocent because the wages of sin is death. So we need the blood of something innocent to cover our sins. So what's the solution for us? Because we obviously, we don't do sacrifices today. So why don't we do sacrifices today? And that's because John the Baptist one day, he was walking along the River Jordan. He saw Jesus and he said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. 
The Bible clearly says that God sent his son, his only son, because he loved us and the price of sin had to be paid. In John 3, 16 through 18, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, and whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. So a person like Gandhi, who's, you know, who's done many great things, he's paying the wrong price for his sin. And Jesus has come so that we do not need uh, to do, we are supposed to do good works, but we do not need good works in order to pay for our sin. Instead, we need to trust in Christ who's come for our sins. It says that Jesus lived a perfect life according to the law. Uh, one story is that Jesus was led by the Spirit out into the desert where Satan tempted him. And Jesus, although he went 40 days and 40 nights without food, he did not fall into temptation. Uh, Hebrews 4.15 says that he has been tempted as we are in every way, yet without sin. So although Jesus experienced everything we experienced in life, he did not fall and he did not um, fail to meet the standard of God's righteousness. He did meet that standard for us. And it says then he taught with great authority. He taught things like he would correct false interpretation of scripture. Uh, when you look at, at Matthew 7, 28 through 29, you see Jesus saying, you have heard it was said, but I say to you, uh, what was happening in the time of Jesus was there were many misinterpretations of Old Testament scripture and about the law. And there were um, many traditions being added to that. And Jesus came in and said, no, guys, that's not what was meant by these scriptures. Let me help you to recorrect your life to the, the, the proper way of understanding that. So Jesus came and he taught uh, people to turn from their sins. He, he told them that they need to love the Lord their God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love their neighbor as their self. In fact, he said those two things cover all of the law, loving God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving our neighbor as ourselves. He told them to love their enemies. What a really difficult thing to do. Um, he said that uh, we should care and do something to help the poor, the oppressed, and the broken. And it said, after his teaching, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. That's Matthew 7, 28 through 29. So Jesus taught with this great authority. And then he, he performed many miracles to prove that his words were really from God. He healed the sick, meaning he can heal us from any diseases that we suffer from. He cast out demons, meaning he has power over all of the spiritual world. He fed 5,000 people, meaning he, he can provide for our daily needs. He calmed a storm, meaning he has power over all of nature because he's the creator. He's the one who set it all in motion and keeps it all in motion. And he even raised people from the dead, meaning he can raise us from the dead. He has power over life and death. Although a lot of people really love Jesus' teaching, he offended many people, and especially his enemies and especially the religious people of his day. Jesus called the religious leaders hypocrites. Uh, when talking about the scribes and Pharisees one time, he says, uh, do and observe what they tell you, but do not, but not the works that they do, for they preach, but they do not practice. And in another passage, he says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, like justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. So they were offended because he was calling people hypocrites. He was calling them out for their sin. They were offended because he claimed to be able to forgive sins, something only God can do. He said to a paralytic one day when he healed him, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. And behold, some of the Pharisees said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. That's from Matthew 9, 2 through 3. And then they were offended because Jesus called himself the Son of God, making himself equal with God. In John 5, 18, he said, this was why the Jew, it, it says, this was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God, which in their eyes meant he was committing blasphemy and he needed to be stoned. He also claimed to be the only way to salvation. 
In John 14, 6, he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That means they couldn't fix themselves. They couldn't do it through the good works and following the law like they thought they could. But Jesus was the only path. And this is a, that was offensive then, and it is offensive now to many people. So when the time was right, Jesus willingly gave himself into the hands of his enemies. It says that they shackled him and they beat him, they scourged him, they spit on him, they cursed him. Isaiah 53, 5 says, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes we are healed. So as they took him, they crucified him with three criminals. Uh, it was a humiliating experience for Jesus. You know, you see the pictures with him with the loincloth around him as he's crucified, but really he had no clothes on. Jesus was naked. He was beaten. He was bruised. He was bleeding. And he was nailed to a cross to die along with criminals. So why does that matter? Well, it matters because at the, at the end, when he died, before, right before he died, he said, it is finished, meaning the price of our sin had been paid. The innocent had died for the guilty. He was one of us. He had lived under the law. And he died under the law, which means because he had lived under the law and he had been sinless, he can die in our place as the innocent sacrifice. But because he was the divine son of God, his sacrifice was infinitely valuable. That means that no matter what your sins are, no matter how bad your life has been, no matter how far you've fallen short of God's standard, Jesus' death on the cross is valuable enough to cover all of your sins, all of my sins, everyone's sins. It is enough to cover our sins. And then God raised Jesus from the dead on the third day, breaking the curse of sin. And why does that matter? I mean, why, why, why didn't he just die on the cross and then go up into heaven? Why did he have to rise from the dead? Well, it matters because it signals to us that he's raising us from spiritual death, but he's also going to raise us from physical death one day. 1 Corinthians 15, 55 says, Oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The grave could not hold him. 1 Corinthians 5, 17, uh, Paul addresses the issue. People were saying, uh, well, maybe Christ wasn't really raised from the dead. And you hear many uh, cults and many other religions today say, oh, we just think he, you know, he rose again spiritually, but not from the dead. And, and Paul writes, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. But then he goes on to say, but thanks be to God, Christ has been raised. And he is going to raise us up as well on the last day, physically and spiritually. And, and again, the, the point of spiritual death is that it's separation from God. When Adam and Eve took the, took the fruit, they both died spiritually and later physically. The spiritual issue is they were separated from God. Spiritual death means we are separated from God. And through Jesus' Jesus's death and resurrection, he's saying that, that wide gap no longer exists. And we now can have a restored personal and close relationship with God through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Then it says that he appeared to more than 500 people. When he appeared to his disciples, uh, they were startled and frightened, and they thought they were seeing a spirit. And he said, touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And then he goes on to say, they gave him a, they gave him a piece of boiled fish, and he took it and ate it before them. He wanted them to know that he really was in flesh and that one day he would raise them in the flesh. And then in 1 Corinthians 5, 6, it says, Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. So Paul here is saying, If you doubt his resurrection, go to those who are still alive, who saw it, who touched him, who spoke with him, and, and, he, and they will testify to you that these things really happened, that it was an actual historic event, and he really did rise from the dead. But then it says that Jesus went away. And before he went away, he said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. John 14, 2 through 3 says, In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. It's a promise that one day we have a home with him in heaven. We do not have to, to worry about uh, our eternal future. Uh, but he also said, while you wait, there is a job to do. And in Acts 1.8, it says, But you will receive power from the Holy Spirit when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all you Judea and Samaria, 
and to the ends of the earth. It's our job to go out and share this good news of what Jesus has done to save us from our sins and transform our lives. We're to share that with the rest of the world to make sure we share it with the people around us and the people all the way to the ends of the earth. And there's a promise in Revelation 7, 9 that uh, there would be a great multitude from every, nation, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne. And they will be singing, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So there's a promise there that when he comes back and he gathers his bride from the ends of the earth, there will be people from every tribe, every nation. And it's our job to make sure that we are taking part in that harvest. And he says that when he comes back, he's coming back as the king, the divine king. He's got authority over everything. The Father has given him authority over everything. But he's not only coming back as the divine king, he's coming back as the judge. He will judge the living and the dead. He has authority to judge sin and to forgive sin. He's coming back as the high priest and honestly as the sacrifice. He, he's already done the sacrifice, but now as the high priest, he is the one interceding for us, making atonement for us for the sins that we have committed in the past. So when he comes back, he's coming back as the king, the, the, the judge, and as the high priest. And he says when he comes back, he's going to make a new heaven and a new earth where there's no more sin, death, or suffering. So he's going to complete that process of solving our problem permanently and eternally um, so that we will live with him in this resurrected earth, this resurrected heaven, where there's no longer... Um, this curse that keeps us from having a close and personal relationship with him and that keeps us from doing the things that we need to do. Our lives will be totally transformed. And so I think the, the question then is, well, what's the appropriate response to the gospel? It's good news, but what are we supposed to do with that? Well, the Bible says that we should believe and repent. In fact, Jesus told um, his disciples on multiple occasions, unless you repent, you too will be destroyed. And repentance means turning away from our sin. We're walking one way and we need to totally turn and go back the other way and follow Jesus. So we need to turn from our sinful life, turn and walk and follow Jesus. And the belief part is not just a an acknowledgement of truth, not just saying, yes, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that he came and died for my sins on the cross and was raised from the dead. But it's a belief that requires action. Uh, we must put our faith into action or else it's not true belief. So as believers, the first thing we need to do is believe and repent. And then it says be baptized as a public confession that you are following Christ. And that public confession is that when you, are, when you go down into the water in baptism, that you are dying to your old way of life and you're being raised to a new way of life. And that we're going to walk into in that new way of life. And it's not just, again, a, a personal symbol that we are trusting in Jesus and we're following him. But it's also a, a symbol that we are joining the body of Christ in walking with Jesus together. So it's our way of um, professing the gospel that we believe it and that we're going to now live it. But it's also a confession that we belong to the body of Christ and will live and walk with that body of Christ. But we should also seek out discipleship. Uh, discipleship is not just you know some little course, some little twenty lessons or something that you that you do once you become a believer to help you to understand the the, the basic truths of Christianity. But discipleship is a process of being in the Word, uh, seeking God's Spirit, and interacting with the local body of Christ to live out the commands of Christ together. Uh, so. Once we have become a believer and we are baptized, then we immediately seek out this lifelong uh, process of discipleship so that we grow towards maturity in Christ together. That we grow towards spiritual maturity together. So, why does the gospel matter? It matters because we are lost and we cannot save ourselves no matter what we do. But the gospel matters because it gives us the, the solution that God himself became a man paid for our sins, rose from the dead, breaking the curse of sin and death, and now offers forgiveness and sin, forgiveness of sins, and a transformed life to all who will turn from sin to him. It is a message of hope that we need, and it is a message of hope that the world needs to hear. It is a message worth dedicating our lives to, and a message, and a message worth dying for. And many people before us have paid that price for the gospel. This message matters. So what should we do in response to the gospel? 
Well, first, as I said before, we need to believe and repent. Believe that Jesus is God's son, that he came, he died on the cross for your sins, and that God raised him from the dead, and that he will also one day raise us from the dead. Uh, we need to repent. We need to turn away from the, the lifestyles that we lived before. It's a total transformation of our life in every aspect, from our relationship with God to our relationship with our, our, our brothers and sisters in Christ to our relationship uh, with the rest of the world. Uh, it's a total change of the way we should live. If you've never before accepted Christ and believed and repented, I would encourage you right now to take some time to Go to God in prayer and confess that you're a broken person, that you have sinned and you're guilty. You don't meet his standard of righteousness and that you want that transformation that comes through the death of Christ on the cross where he pays your price and then he leads you down a different path. Uh, if you don't know how to do that or you're, you're not really certain you want to make that decision yet and you want to um, get to know a little more about the gospel, we have people that would love to connect with you and to talk with you and walk you through the scriptures and show you from Moses and the prophets why the Christ had to come and suffer for your sins and my sins. If you are a believer, you need to share this message with your oikos. That's a Greek word that means your family, friends, and acquaintances. Your family, friends, and acquaintances need to know what Christ has done in your life. In the story of Jesus and the demoniac, where uh, Jesus heals this man of many demons, the man turns to Jesus and says, let me go with you. Let me walk with you. And Jesus says, no, what I want you to do right now is to go and to share everything that God has done with you, with your family, friends, and acquaintances. He goes and he shares, it. the Bible says he goes and he shares with everyone he knew. That's what Christ wants of us. He wants us to share with the people around us. If you don't know how to do that, if you don't know how to share your faith, again, there are, there are people in our church, there are friends, family, there are leaders that would love to sit down with you and help you to be prepared, help you to know how to share your faith and walk alongside you as you begin to practice that and begin to share your faith. The Bible says that we should always be prepared for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Uh, for the reason for that hope we have in Jesus Christ. So I hope if, if you're not actively practicing sharing your faith, that that's something you would seek out and you would learn how to do and that you would become an active uh, participant in the body of Christ in sharing our faith to the ends of the earth. So today as we close, you know, again, the, the title of this message was um, Things That Make a Difference. In the gospel, we can see it makes a difference in our life and it makes a difference in the world around us. And so I hope you will be actively sharing that message. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that you came and you saved us. You did not send someone else, but you yourself. You came, you suffered, you died on the cross, and you rose from the dead so that we might be transformed by that message, Lord. We pray as you continue to transform our lives and those around us by that message that we would be faithful to walk, in your way that we would be faithful to make the gospel the central focus of our life and make sure that everything we do comes in line with that gospel, Lord. And may we live it and may we verbally share it in a way that brings a lost world to the light, Lord, that they may come to know you as their Savior too. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.